Uh, we're really lucky to have Ian Fruit with us today. I think a lot of folks will have seen Ian in a lot of the tying streams that we've had uh, in the past with him. Um, but if you didn't know, Ian is probably about as knowledgeable as anybody when it comes to the Grand River and specifically the tailwater stretch of the, uh, sort of the upper Grand River uh, that we have around. And so tonight he's gonna kind of break down for us uh, so sort of some of the intricacies of, of that stretch of river and how it fishes and things you want to consider uh, should be a, a pretty fun time. So he's got a, a presentation here for us. If everyone wants to ask questions, you're more than welcome. Just keep yourself on mute and use the chat function if you want to do that. And uh, this should be fun. So welcome, Ian. How are you? I'm doing well. Doing good. Excited to be back, Chris. You keep inviting me back, so something's going right. So <laughs> this is a new one. I got to use PowerPoint. I'm not tying flies. It got to wear a red shirt, not a blue shirt, so I could tie in front of it. So it's good. And uh, yeah, so I'll jump into it if it works. Uh, and so just really briefly about me. Um, yeah, I've been guiding on the upper Grand for, geez, over 20 years. I learned to fish on the upper Grand and I was mentored by Ian Colin James, who was the first uh fishing guide on the Grand River. Uh, so I probably, even, I should know a little bit about it anyways, but uh, I, what I'll go through today is what I, how I approach it, how we think about it. Uh, and I welcome the questions. Let's have a conversation about it. And uh, we will open it to right now. Chris and I can't figure out where this picture is. It's somewhere on the upper Grand. So if anybody knows where it is, put it in the, put it in the comments. Um, so I'm gonna jump into uh, today. Uh, just a really, really brief history. Um, like what's a tailwater? Why is it different? I'll call it a guides tour of the upper grand, uh, fishing the seasons and then some techniques to, <laughs> I can't say it, it'll be techniques, tips, tricks kind of sprinkled throughout. So very, very quickly, just the grand water headwaters are way up in Dundalk, Till Plain, um, and it's, you know, I would just say the Grand River, the whole thing is a very diverse uh, river. Like I think of it as Fergus all the way to Cayuga, and it goes past Cayuga, but it, it's a pretty long river, pretty big river. It offers majority of freshwater game fish, uh, brown trout in the upper, great steelhead fishing through the middle and lower, walleye, catfish, it's a bit of a fisherman's paradise, and there's all kinds of tribs like Whiteman's Creek, but uh, today, we could be here for a week uh, going through the different parts of the Grand River. We're going to zoom in on the, what we call the Upper Grand. Um, well, so I'm just going to move this so I can kind of read my slide. Um, I won't go through detailed. You can read slides, but you know, uh, it, it, the history of it, I thought this was interesting. Um, it was a flood. They had big flood discharge. It used to go from like uh, over 1,300. Uh, what is that cubic? meters per second uh, to summer lows of one. You can't maybe see it because of the uh, piece. So it had a huge variation. There's public pressure uh, to really work to stabilize the flows. And the Shand Dam was built in 1942 in partnership with the GRCA, which is a Grand River Conservation Authority. So this resulted in Bellwood Lake. So if you haven't been to the area, Fergus, as a Bellwood Lake. It's about a 10 kilometer long lake. You'll see all kinds of boating traffic and stuff along that. And the Shan Dam is below Bellwood and the Grand flows um, down below it. And uh, what this does is it's a tailwater fishery. So the stratified water, usually warmer on the top, cooler on the bottom flows through. So this cold water uh, keeps the temps and the flows relatively stable, although we do see uh, it's very good in the winter, but we do see still some high temps and, and temps over 75 degrees, which can be dangerous for trout to survive. But there's a really nice chunk where the water remains very, very stable. And overall, as a tailwater, it keeps it quite stable for trout to survive. So it is a stocked fishery. So it's stocked with about 20 to 30,000 fish per year, about five to 10 inches, depending on how they do it. Like last year it was 23,000 trout went in there so probably can catch one or two if we try um if you're wondering how fast they grow it's about four inches per year and stocking stocking usually around mid-may so you can talk uh, friends of the grand or the GRCA might have the exact it's you i always go with like second weekend in may ish uh, you'll know because the water's like boiling over with uh, stockies when they first do it um you know if you catch fish around 12 inches they're probably one year old you get into the 
you know, over 12 to 14, probably two. And I, when I put here a 14 to 16 is a two-year-old fish, depending on the size, could be a three-year-old fish. That's a pretty good way of looking at it. Um, there's big fish on the Grand for sure. Uh, there's been fish caught over 30 inches for sure. Uh, and it is definitely not uncommon to catch 20 inch fish. And I mean, a legit 20 inch fish. And those, there are some really big uh, browns in there. Uh, you can catch multiple 20 inch fish. But I think the hard fact recently is there hasn't been that many 14 to 18 inchers. So we tend to find smaller fish and then really large fish, at least I do. So maybe some people are better at catching those midsize. And there's been a lot of theories around it. So I'm not going to pontificate like predate, predation from walleye to the high, some of the flow temperate getting a little bit too high or sorry, not the flow, the um, temperature getting too high, uh, all kinds of various reasons, but like to see, I'll be happier when I, in the last few years, I haven't seen as many of those. I call them mid-sized trout, whatever you want to call them. Um, but uh, so you, you tend to get a little bit around the smaller size and then really, really a lot more big fish than I've gotten in the past. Yeah, I'd agree. And that's, that's definitely a common point you hear. It's a funny one. Yeah. And so I know there's a lot of work. So I included, I reached out to the Friends of the Grand. Uh, I think they do some great work around there. They've been in partnership, just if, you, if you've never heard of it. So the Friends of the Grand do all kinds of stuff around the Upper Grand. They've been stalking in partnership through 1995. 27 kilometer stretch down stream of Shandam. They do, that's 20,000 per year. They clear and maintain about nine access points. There's a whole bunch of access points along the Grand, but they maintain a, a lot of the heavy trafficked ones very, very nicely, like almost manicured in some sections to make it easier for people to get through. They do gather 200 garbage bags annually. That kind of disturbed me when I saw that. I'm glad they're picking it up, but it's a lot of garbage. And they've been tree planting like crazy there and over 50,000 uh, trees planted. So they're very big in stream rehabilitation. There's They have a whole bunch of goals, uh, which I, I didn't want to, turn into a Friends of the Grand um, update, but what I got excited about is they're really looking at some of these uh, factors that are causing some of those mid-sized fish to uh, uh, not be as prevalent. But if you see Friends of the Grand, if you haven't been to the Grand, you'll see Friends of the Grand on the, you know, the garbage bins and access points, stuff like that. So rules and regs. It's catch and release for trout in this section. In most sections, single barbless. There are a few two fly sections, but you know, the simple rule, single barbless. I mean, I'll state the obvious, have a valid fishing license, follow all the regs. So you can check out the detailed regs in the grand because there are some areas that have a two fly and I'll, I'll, I'll point out a, uh, one or two, but take a look at the regs. Simple rule though, just think of one fly, single and uh, barbless. Um, I like to say this, this doesn't always happen. Give people space. Remember the 20,000 fish in the river? There's lots of fish in the river. You know, don't be afraid to just go to where someone's not. Or if you walk in and you see five guys standing in a circle, you probably want to get into that anyways, but uh, just move somewhere else uh, or walk up fame downstream. Um, also, don't be afraid to fish behind people. These fish get used to people. These are not wild brown uh, trout in some really remote place. They are used to people. Um, so Chris and I were talking about Pennsylvania before here. Those are wild trout. They also get used to people. Um, so they're they're actually quite tolerant of people traffic, meaning they get used to people. So they reset faster. They uh, to surprisingly don't view as, as dangerous as much some other trouts and other habitats. But that doesn't mean get lazy and don't lower your profile or fish when you're trying to catch a fish. It just means you can fish behind people, in my opinion, pretty comfortably with a reasonable amount of time. All right. So I get asked a lot, like for people coming from out of town, um, you know, over, overall rod for the Grand your overall trout rod, four or five weight. If I had to pick one, probably I'd use a four if I had one rod to use for the whole Grand. Uh, I wouldn't go more than a six weight, which can be good for streamers, especially people like to chuck the, the big things the size of a small child. Um, Euro nymphing works very well on the Grand. Uh, it's very similar to the rivers in Europe. Uh, in the fact, from a flow perspective, um, you know, uh, so those techniques work really well. Uh, you hear a lot about Spanish and French style fishing and stuff like that. It is very conducive to the type of water in the Grand. Um, so we, I would recommend two to three weights. I think getting a four, four weight uh, European rods are a little heavier. Uh, for this, but I would use a 10 foot to 11 foot in that range. There's no bad choice in there. The 11 foot is actually just for fishing farther away, um, but you can't go wrong in that range. 
Uh, for indicators, again, most of the grand is single fly. Um, so you, you know you can't use the dry dropper uh, tactics unless you want to cut the hook off. Um, but these New Zealand wool indicators work fantastic. They're very, very sensitive. Um, it's a little tool you hook it and put it through. They put uh, some New Zealand sheep wool through there, brush it up. You can slide it up and down your indicator. They're super subtle. They land, they don't spook fish, and they're very, very sensitive. So I know Drift sells those as well. I would 100% recommend these for all kinds of indicator fishing. Um, but if you haven't used one of those, I'm totally doing a sales pitch. I don't get any kickbacks or anything for New Zealand wool indicators, but uh, totally have those in your back pocket uh, if you want to use an indicator. Much better and than the thingamabobbers and stuff like that, or the airlocks. Uh, the what's the OPPO? What's the new one that's changing the world? Oso OPPO uh, Oros. Oros. Uh, those would be good yeah, too. Nice steelhead. Yeah, th those are great uh, as well, but a little clunky for sections in the grand. If you're going to use an indicator, um, and that's actually when it hits the water, in my opinion, it's a little much. Um, I think a dry fly is a must on the grand. I mean, nothing is an absolute, but uh, but dry flies work really well and can take big fish. So it's one of those rivers you can target big fish on dries for sure. Uh, and I also think it's really good practice dry fly fishing. So um, when they have the recently stocked fish where you can actually have a lot of numbers, they're small fish, but boy, that can get you really good at hooking fish, trying to land them. They can be actually quite a pain in the butt. Uh, and test you more than you think. So it's just a fun, they can be really, really fun. Uh, I would caution, um, I've got complacent with stockies and then a bigger fish will come out. So pay attention when you see fish uh, on the feet up top. But three to five weight is probably your best. I tend to like a bit of a faster action rod, but choose your favorite dry fly rod uh, for the grand. And again, you, if you had an all rounder, you could get away with one rod that's a dry fly or a, you know your standard fishing rod between the, as I said, four or five weight. Um, streamers work really well. It's a trout river, big and small. I know I don't know if that's still the trend, but the Kelly Gallup, Zoo Cougar, uh, stuff like that. Fishing those a long time on the Grand. Uh, that's not a secret anymore, but that, that'll that that'll turn some big fish. I do find it rolls a lot more fish than it'll hook. Uh, I use it actually to find fish, sometimes go back and catch them. Um, but, you know, don't be afraid to pull those big streamers. Be careful with articulated streamers because they can have two hooks in them. So just make sure you have a one hook articulated streamer. Uh, but if you're looking at big streamers, Zoo Cougar does work really, really well. I also like your... You know, Thunder Creeks, for those who've seen my tying sessions, are, are great and smaller streamers. Um, and I actually like them on a clear intermediate line. So an intermediate line, call it one and a half to two section. You know, those Rio makes them, a lot of people make them, it used to be called slime lines. It's clear and it, um, it sinks at a reasonably slow pace. Um, way, way back with my mentorship for me and James, we were going to 15 foot leaders and stuff like that. And I was really just to keep the fly line away from the, the streamer um, because you are usually working downstream with a traditional streamer approach. We 100% found we caught more fish on an intermediate line and didn't have to use as long of a leader. So we, you could put that four to eight foot leader um, and it just, just brought it, uh, you're not put it, putting it right on the bottom, but just tucks it under, it gets out of the current, you get a better, um, you just get better results. Uh, I would say when you are doing that technique and walking through, uh, you don't just have to do the blind chuck, pick your targets, look for those little depressions, those little changes in velocity, and, you know, be actually pretty surgical with your streamer. You, and you could be quite surprised on what you can pick up. Um, I recommend... Andrew is asking if uh, a poly leader might be a good yep. option. Yep, that could be good too. Yep. Again, then, I, then I'm probably going, yeah, longer Then I'm just going longer, but you could use a poly leader as well to kind of make that leader longer. Um, I used to just carry it like when I was a one rotter. Now I carry way too many with me, like I'm a golfer, but uh, you know, I would just carry a, you know, I'd have my call it three to three or four weight line. And I have a same reel with a spool of intermediate line. And when I put streamers, I just switch it out and, and do it, but you can definitely get away with, with adjusting, just go a little bit longer on your leader. And that's more just to keep the fly line away. Cool. And I do tend to fish a little farther casts on that too, because the Grand isn't super fast water. You are facing downstream. You do tend to spook 
some fish. Um, I use uh, a net. I used to be no net guy. Now I'm back to the net. Um, it's be especially better for light tippets. I like a lot of six X seven X as your general, not streamers, but everything else. Uh, I think you'll find you get pretty used to six X and seven X doesn't sound that crazy, depending on how stiff your rod is. Um, I think anything over, if you're getting into five X, I think you're fishing way too heavy for, unless it's a streamer. Um, waders, I recommend it. Uh, that's actually for walking through the shrub on, bush on the side. You know, there's all kinds of stuff around there. Uh, you can wet wade when the water gets warm. I did it lots. Um, just, you know, whatever suits your comfort uh, level, but waders are recommended for most of the year. Um, I would recommend studs or cleats. Uh, some people like felt and, and things along those lines, uh, but some type of grip. Uh, it does get a little bit of a moss on there. I've had a lot of few clients take falls that uh, or look a little bit like Bambi on ice because it can be a little more slippery than you think. It's not deep or anything like that. It's just you don't want to fall. Uh, but keep in mind with those cleats on there, you sound like a horse. Uh, so tend to stay, remember that you're grinding your cleats on the on the rocks. If I'm not in fast water, I, I always remember that and I try to stay farther back. Uh, if I get into the faster water, no problem. Um, real basic stuff, but I'll put it on there. Sunscreen, it's an open river. You can get totally fried on there. Uh, always wear glasses when you're fly fishing, sunglasses that is, and bring water with you. Again, I've just give you some fundamentals there. Uh, on the sunglasses side of things, I would rotate between kind of your rose or that type of uh, color and yellow tint. Uh, yellow tint when there's low light, rose when there's high light. Um, if you can find just one somewhere in between. I, I kind of vary. I'm not sure which one I like better. You do, uh, if you have two pairs, I, uh, I'll i just pick, depending on looking up, is it going to be a cloudy day? Is it going to be a bright day? I find the rose on bright days, yellow on the, the cloudy. Uh, and then the color of the grand is a tea colored water. Glare can be a real pain, like really annoying, especially for Euro fishing or even dries. Real simple thing. Grand's pretty easy to cross. Go fish it from the other side. So if you're finding you just can't get the light right, if, if available, go around and fish it from the other side. And a really good tip, if you hit a bunch of fish in one spot where it makes sense, if you can go fish that same stretch from the other side, go do that. You present your fly at a different angle and you'll pick up fish you missed and it, it, you'd be amazed. Uh, just gives you a different perspective on the river. So uh, the Grand is very overall pretty easy waiting. Um, so just make sure if you can fish it from both sides, don't just get in the habit of fishing it from one side. Of course, runs like the cedars and stuff where it's a row of cedars. You're not going to go walk into the cedars and fish it from the other side, but use some reasonability when you can fish it from either side. That's great. I don't know if you're going to cover it, up, but maybe it would be good to back up as well. I almost feel like maybe we should define kind of the area we're talking about. Because as you so, say, it's a big river. It's coming up. That's the whole. Uh, okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. So um, that's the whole presentation. I'm just going through this. This is the warm up. Uh, so uh, so what, just now, now we're getting into kind of the sections and stuff like that. I just wanted to get the kind of the fundamentals out of the way. Uh, so what is a tailwater? Some people ask me that quite a bit. Simple. It's just water below a dam. It's got an outflow. Um, depending on release levels, it gives you more stable cold water for trout. And the bigger the dam. So if you've been in places like the San Juan River with huge lakes, I mean, that's putting out. 52, 50 degree water year round. So you have trout in the desert. Um, here at, at Bellwood, it's not that deep or deep enough. So you tend to not get as um, cold, but it does keep cold flows. And it means coldest water usually uh, at the closest to the dam. Um, so it's definitely less likely to flood. So you don't get that flow changes. So think of the, the credit will be different or other water. They, they, they're not a tail water. So the flows are different. And sometimes you can get caught on if they've released the flows from the dam. Hey, it didn't rain or anything. Why is the river kind of chocolatey and kind of blown out? Well, they, they've they released some water for some reason above the dam. And it's, uh, you know, kind of pushed, pushed a different river environment than would the environmental conditions. But it can work in your favor the other way. You know, the credit, you, you might think the grand's blown out, might not be. Um, best thing to do is check your flows as much as you can and, and just uh, get to, you'll see the kind of historical stable flows. I won't get into the CFFs and stuff uh, around that. Um, so just keep in mind, it's very important when I start going where to fish, when to fish. 
cold water is coming from the dam and as it goes down river it's going to warm up. Um, they produce, tailwaters produce significant bug life. So, you know, when you're reading those or watching a show and a guy throws a big stimulator caddis and 15 trout try to eat it and they're all cutthroat, well, that's probably in an environment where they don't see a lot of food. Um, here, know that tailwaters are bug factories. So they see a lot of food. And so they can tend to be a little bit more technical in, uh, because of just the volume of food. And I don't like the mindset that trout are always keyed into uh, a certain type of, uh, you know, the only eating one thing that can tend to be a, a mis misnomer on a tailwater. But that 10% of the time, if there's a hatch or really a lot of food coming out of a specific bug or something like that, you will find they'll key into that. And I'll go into some of the details on that. But just know that's about 10% of the time. They'll get down the rabbit hole of thinking you've got the wrong fly or something like that. But be aware they see a lot of food. They also eat a lot of sticks, cigarette butts, stones. <laughs> so don't, don't overthink it on that piece. Um, the most important thing I can uh, go through is the links to water temperature and the river environment and the bug life and the trout are all linked. So I think making meaning of the grant is going to make sense as you start thinking about it from a temperature perspective. All right, this is the part, Chris, you've been waiting for. We're there. So uh, three parts to the grand, I would call the upper, the middle, and the lower. So I mean, when I say the upper grand, we mean of the overall Grand River where, like, not to confuse people, you call the middle grand like Branford and the lower grand like Cayuga. Uh, when we say the upper grand, we kind of mean the Fergus Alora area, the brown trout water up near the tailwater. Uh, within that section, the upper is a town called Fergus, and you can see it, if you can see my cursor right here, um, I've been Fergus upstream up to Shand Dam. That's the upper section. Uh, the middle section, at least what I'm calling it, uh, is Alora to Fergus. So this is your this is your middle section in here. And then the lower is below Alora. And it goes down to about Montrose. But I stop around a town called Inverha in around here. That's kind of the lower section. You can go a little bit lower and don't be afraid to explore. But then you're starting into the lower uh, sections. So if you think it was about 27 kilometers. So the dam is right here. And it flows all the way down there. So if you think of cold water coming out of here, it has, you can get some pretty different te temperature fluctuations on the same day from Inverhaw all the way to Fergus. So when you see, this is a clip from my truck, I uh, use those sumo racks, whatever you want. Um, I highly recommend having something where you can move easily with your gear. Um, I will talk about fishing with the thermometer and not being afraid to move. Sometimes it just gets busy, but I'll, I'll be driving around checking the temps myself just to make sure what's going to be the best place to fish. Make sense? Any questions? Yep. On that? All right. So uh, it's location, location, location. Um, so the number one is fish with a thermometer. And I'm going to talk by kind of location about that. But if you don't own a thermometer, if you take one thing away from <laughs> me, shoot my mouth off for an hour here, get a thermometer. I like the digital ones because they're faster. I don't care what the thermometer is. Be able to take a temperature for sure. And don't rely on, I'm going to look at some website that's going to tell me the temperature. The temperatures can change throughout the day. And you'll really want to know what's going on the grand from a temperature perspective. Um, Recently taught stock fish versus wintered overfish. Um, you know, second week in May, you get stocked fish. So first couple of weeks there, it's a bit of a um, free for all because you have fish that are been in tanks, they've been pellet fed, they react, you know, differently. They start to normalize and become kind of, you know, attuned to the river environment. But your winter overfish, they're they're already fully attuned to that environment. So they're gonna react differently. So if you're just crushing it, doing something with stockies in mid mid May, you may have to think differently to catch some of the bigger fish. But again, I'm not here to tell you what's a fun day. Both can be a fun day and we'll talk about that when we get into a couple of the sections. Um, go ahead. It might be a thing to note as well, especially for any more kind of beginner anglers who wanna get out and like the Grand is like say, it's great for, beginners, more experienced anglers, because you have both types of fish. You have those more educated ones and the, the, you know, the numbers too. 
but if you're looking to like just get out and you know hit a bunch of fish you probably do want to wait until mid may because it's a pretty limited number of holdovers that you get compared to the stalkers right yep yeah for sure and then uh we'll go through kind of when um can i go through the seasons i'll really kind of go through that piece um conditioning just kind of some fundamentals um i'm just going to say this no matter what season we're talking about what section of the river actually any river in the world it's what are they fish conditioned to so back to our stocky example when they're first dumped in the water they are conditioned to a pellet being thrown in the water uh you know a fish that's been wintered over probably been seeing midges for a while uh a fish in mid june's probably seen a whole bunch of caddis up closer to the dam so you just simple big questions like that will help you not go down the rabbit hole because there's a very bad history on the grand of pushing over the top entomology um and i will i've been around for it I, there's a, a bit of a history there we can it can tend to make it more complex than it actually needs to be so as you see understanding food sources is good pump the brakes on speaking latin there's no need we need to be fish don't speak latin their english isn't even very good if you ask me uh but they're you know don't get in, again if you like it go ahead uh the fish do not care uh, don't get intimidated, uh, by, you know, the, I don't know, I can't even use, I don't know, whatever the Latin terms are for the box. Uh, I was going to try to be cool and say one, I don't even know one. Um, uh, and then, you know, real tell people if in doubt, I was taught this by Ian James, you know, a great guide. He would just go there and he'd hit a bunch of bushes and what would fly out? A bunch of bugs. Oh, look, there's some caddis. Oh, they're about a size 12. Ah, they're green on the body. Good enough. I'm going to put a 12, 12 dryer nymph on some place to start. Grab a rock. Grand is pretty easy to reach in. You're not dunking under. Grab a rock, turn it over. You're going to see case caddis, mayflies, depending on where you're at, whatever. Um, so just some place to start. Usually just kind of general size and what's going on. Um, so, uh, that's a really, really good tip. And you'll, when it's, when the caddis are happening, just whack, 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 whack. What's the predominant caddis that comes out and you'll actually see a big variance go, Oh, okay. There's maybe no wrong choice here. It's just, which one do I want to make? Um, general guideline too, for, if you're new to the grand, vary between kind of natural flies, your pheasant tails and stuff like that, that are really natural. Maybe a fly, pheasant tail with a hot spot or a really bright fly, like a rainbow warrior. Um, you can catch a lot of fish on attractor patterns as well. So, and I mean, big fish. Like, like uh, Rainbow Warrior is a, if you don't know, it's a Lance Egan pattern from out west. It works all over the place. It's a really flashy, silvery fly. It takes lots of big fish for me on the grand. So just, you know, vary between the two. Don't get hung up that everything has to be super natural with like eyes glued on and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, it's probably not your fly. It's presentation over pattern across the board. So the better you're presenting some first question you should ask yourself on the grand, did it present my, actually first question, did I spook the fish? No, didn't spook the fish. Second, did, did my presentation suck? Uh, nope. Uh, okay, then uh, I'll, I'll switch flies or try something different. So just remember, be hard on yourself on presentation. Don't think you've got the wrong pattern. And the number one thing I say to clients on the grand, stop growing moss. People have a tendency to not move, <laughs> just stand there. So don't be a scarecrow, save those for the fields. Um, I know people that'll stand at Tombstone for nine hours and I think they've got foot places like marked. Um, and again, if that's fun for you, go for it. And if you wanna fish one pool to see how it changes throughout the day, go for it. It's your day, but don't be afraid to move. Um, you can move and cover water. I find it's a lot better to cover water, uh, you know, fish something well and go back and try it again, but move. Um, there's a lot of room to move and you can find lots of space. Those are some, if I just said general, going to the grand, I don't know where the hell I'm going to fish, but that's what I can do. This is what, it, what comes to mind. Yeah, I like that. I feel like um, people overlook a lot of the big, big water, if you want to call it that, on the grand too. Like the, the, the Grand does have versus say like River Lake the Cradle, I think some really major attractive pools on it. But then there's a lot of in-between water and especially when bugs start moving. Like there's a lot Where's of stuff the big fish walk past, right? Yeah, and I'll get to it. I think like mine, I would say 
If, I'll use Tombstone, for example. Yeah, people can, and if you don't know Tombstone, it's in the Upper Grand. It's just ask anybody, they'll all point. <laughs> and it's a rock that looks like a tombstone. It's a great spot. You'll see me, people probably see me guiding there like crazy. There's lots of water I like through there. Uh, but the tombstone kind of pool, it gets a lot of attention. Yep, you catch big fish out of there. I th I see more big fish caught above it, right above it, because the big fish just kind of move up there. Uh, and I see, a, I mean, I've seen people take some monster fish in really skinny water and below it as well. So uh, depending, I'll get into temperature, do not assume there's not a fish in some skinny water. And it's usually a big one. Um, they tend to be a little more comfortable doing that. Uh, and I think that really, I, you know, I used to live in BC and I have friends that have come here from BC and the Grand can kind of freak them out because it's pretty flat and it's not big, fast water. Um, so that can be an advantage as well to just go, you know, there could be a trout anywhere. You're only going to find them though if you're moving. Um, bug list, I've heard some people call this entomology. Um, so, um, here's what, here's my version of what's on the grand. There's caddis, there's mayflies, they've got midges too, crane flies, and it can be a real pain in the ass, crane flies, uh, isopods, look like a potato bug or a scud, super important, underline isopod, uh, for sure, terrestrials, yeah, there's grasshoppers. I've never caught a fish in a grasshopper. I was going to fish them. Um, beetles can work well, but if you if you ask me, a terrestrial ants, ants uh, uh, for sure. Don't forget about crayfish. Brown trout love crayfish. Uh, minnows. I like dace patterns myself. Pick your favorite minnow pattern and sculpins for sure. Um, so if you say, "Gee, I'm going to the Grand. What do I need?" Something that you like as a catter's pattern. A bunch of different, probably. Caddis can be pretty small, but as a general rule, 18 to 14 with a couple on both sides of that, have a couple 12s, have a couple in the 20s. Mayflies, yeah, 14s, you know, you might get the odd 16, the odd, some 12s. Midges, I tend to go really small, like your 18s and uh, 20s. Crane flies, 16 to tw uh, 18 in there. We'll talk a bit about them. They're a pain in the ass. Uh, isopod, 14, 16. Hair's ear works really, really well. Don't overthink it. Um, your terrestrial, your ants, they get pretty small. Um, cray flit, crayfish and sculpins, I use a merge pattern. You know what else works well? A woolly bugger looks like both of them. Just grab a woolly bugger that's kind of olive, olive and black woolly bugger, cover your bases or brown. Uh, Thunder Creek minnow for me on a dace. But you can, look, I'm, I think I've tied everything I use on the grand like 10 times with Chris on the line. Um, but if you have any questions, fire away. Um, I pulled this off of your website, Chris, and there's a lovely hatch chart. So you never have to pay attention to anything. You just look at this and all the dates are perfect all the time. Right, Chris? Yeah. I have two favorite Ian James stories. One when a guy kept swinging his wet fly in our pool and just took it as scissors and cut his fly line in half. That was a that was a fun one, and just watched his line just drift down the river. That was when you're a 300 pound Scottish guy, you can just do that. Uh, the other one is we were guiding, and uh, it was a very keen guy who kept maybe disagreeing with what we were paying attention to on the river, and he kept pointing to a hatch chart in a book. So he took the hatch chart and held it to the river, and the guy's like, "What are you doing? I'm just telling the trout what's happening today." Right. So uh, I always remember that story. So these are fantastic guidelines and they even put the hatch time on here, which we'll get into it. But, you know, if you want to know what's generally happening, pretty good. You know, so when you're fishing in May, OK, you know, there's going to be some Hendrickson's around, some olives. Yeah. OK. Saying that, you know, OK, not much else going on. And oh, there's my friend, the isopod. Right. They're conditioned back to what are they conditioned to? I would put a black line across the bottom for an isopod. They say isopods all year, um, you know, and you can just kind of move around and you see when the caddis start to happen and stuff like that. But, you know, as you can see the general size, as I said, these are pretty handy. Don't lose your mind on the left side going, I mean, I, okay, I'm, I'm going to be controversial. I don't think the isonychia pattern with the little white down the body means crap uh at all maybe somebody can show me different um you know if you need a mayfly pattern use a pheasant tail 
If you need a caddis pattern, use a hare's ear. If you need a light, <laughs> you know, pattern for, uh, you know, a uh, mayfly, probably just use a hare's ear or tie it with a lighter pheasant tail. Don't get hung up in having, I got to have a gray fox and isonychia and that, You'll see that some some of the fly shops. It was really prevalent when I started fly fishing. We used to probably push that as guides a lot. Like we'd have our Hendrickson nymph, whatever. A pheasant tail will crush it as as Hendrickson. Um, but there are also some big, you know, pay attention to a couple here: the brown drakes and the hexes. We also the Grand also has the big boys, right? And there are some like kind of forgotten about. I got some clients who are crazy about the drakes um yeah those are size eight mayflies that you can fish in the evening i'll tell you where they where that happens um oh it says it see hatch time evening there you go um so but you know your your evenings where they got it on their brown drake yeah depending on the weather um you know generally depending on what the summer is like or the, sorry the spring but when it, you know paying attention to that can be some pretty phenomenal fishing for fun is going down and putting big dries in front of uh, large browns I'd yeah. like some I feel like it would be worth noting as well that and may, you'll probably touch on it later anyways but uh, just spelt some provas that like uh, some of these bugs just are only present in specific areas, right? Just because yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, the yeah. ground changes dramatically, right? So like if you had to highlight, I don't know, maybe three bugs that people could confidently say you'll find right through. The oh, you just wait, Chris. You're like, you are just like, okay, uh, okay. I'm going to mute you. I've got it uh, in a second. Yeah, we'll get there. Uh, it's, it's intrigue that I'm providing, Chris, intrigue. Uh, okay. But the one that I just... Just go home, the Canis, the Fisherman's Curse, 26, 28. Don't mimic this, do something else. Um, I'm done with that. Uh, if you want to go insane and put a rubber room in your fly shop, in your fly room, go for it. Like size 28, little white things. I call them no see -ums. I don't know if they're eating some, probably Canis. Um, that, that's a tough one. Pull a streamer through there or something like that. I would do something different, but that's one that'll drive you to drink for sure. And I have never caught a fish on a grasshopper. I hear people do, but allegedly they're great through the second half of the year. All right. This is important. Now, Chris, sit up. Here we go. Uh, this is uh, so just big fact for you. Uh, ideal temp for a brown trout, if you can pick one, it's 61 degrees Celsius. Um, but peak feeding is about 55 to 63, but when you get into the fifties, their, their metabolism starts to warm up and you get over 63 up to 65, then it starts to become a different thing over 65. I don't fish for, for them. I'll leave them be. Um, but it is really important. The locations we're going to get into, I, this is the important part to me, not the bugs and stuff like that. Where do you find the bugs? But number one, what happens in the spring? So your spring temps 40 to 55, kind of back to get a thermometer. Um, remember, lower section, we're going to get to it, warms up faster than the upper. So in the spring, you have higher temperatures in the lower section, colder in the upper sections. If you want warmer, this is the time when you want warmer temperatures for your brands. And you actually almost hit an hour or two of prime feeding early in the season. Um, so what you'll find in, in your kind of early May or through May, everybody's there at six in the morning while well, the water temps are still pretty cold. As it warms up your peak, your best times like noon to like three, everybody's taking a lunch and then they come back in the evening. In the spring, sleep in, go go to the river nine or 10 and fish through the, after, uh, through the late morning into the afternoon. Cause you have these kind of short periods where it kind of hits the peak period. And so you get a short duration. If you want a general thing on bugs in the spring, they're bigger than later in the season and they're darker. Why? Because they, the, um, they want to stay warmer. So they catch more, like they, the thermal heat, uh, they're darker. And also the river bottom tends to be darker, so they blend into it. Uh, when you get into later spring, early summer, now our temps start to get a little more consistent, a little bit higher. This is the time when you usually kill it. Like the best people say, what's the best time? Well, June. You know, because why the temps are better, they're more consistent. That prime feeding time isn't like two hours. Now it's like six or seven. Now it's like eight till four. It's like guiding paradise, right? Um, you have longer stretches. 
now you want to start playing, gee, is it the, is it the lower middle? Am I going to go to the upper? Maybe I'm going to start the morning in the lower when the temps are good. Oh, it's getting a little, it's missed. I'm going to move up and try to chase some hatches and stuff like that, or just fish some different temps. Again, rod rack on the car, thermometer in hand, maybe in your teeth as you're driving down the road is what I'd like to see. Um, you start to see, you know, again, bugs start to get brown, a little olivey. Um, they start to get a little bit lighter, a little smaller. Don't worry about it. I'm just letting you know, I don't really care that much about it, but in summer, um, now it gets a little bit dangerous. You get kind of your 58s and your 70 pluses. Now it's the opposite. You're going to go early, early morning, probably in the upper, you know, um, late evenings, probably upper middle, like you again, watch your temps. Um, and then recently when you get into summer, there's a cutoff in July right now. I have not got a great reason. I kind of stopped guiding and fishing uh, as we get through July. Um, all of a sudden it'll just be off color and warm coming out. And that might be some of the issues we're having. Um, I've had people say it's been boat traffic on Bellwood is through the roof, which it is, which is churning it up and causing like silt to come down. Um, I don't know what it is, but you'll kind of find maybe, I know just straight up, Sometime late July, you'll be like, okay, why is the water super warm and chocolate milky? And it doesn't really kind of go away until the, the fall. You can find your moments, but it's yeah. really interesting. It's something recent. And so I'll start to fish some other rivers, but you, you, you get a good season in there, but that's kind of my time to go. Okay. And this is not where there's, uh, you know, been a big rain or something that's blown out. You'll just notice it and you'll start taking your temps going, Hmm even in the upper. And then, uh, you know, you can go right to the very upper. We'll talk about that. But then I really would say, just don't fish during the high temps. It's hard on the fish. They don't, they're not active anyways. Bugs are really, really small. And if you're going to fish, it's going to be really, really early in the morning or really late at night. Uh, in the fall, you know, you start to get a drop. It depends on that outflow. It feels to be like later falls now. Again, it's all going to be weather dependent. Watch for those cold nights, though, and you can fish in the morning and have some really good action. Um, interestingly enough, the coldest water will be in the lower section. So you've got a bit of a warmer water coming out. The cold nights, the think of the lake hasn't stratified to cool, cool the water at the bottom as much as the lower river once it flows. So it's a little bit of a mind mess that you go, oh, I'm gonna go check the lower, go back to my friends down in Inverhaw and see if what the temperatures are doing down there. Your bugs start to get a little bit darker again and bigger. And then this is your last week or so, might be a good time to go unicorn hunting with streamers and stuff like that, depending on uh, what your uh, temps are looking like. Nice, maybe uh, just one thing I would just point out though, 61 Fahrenheit, not Celsius. Oops. Yeah, that's Fahrenheit. Celsius would be super <laughs> okay. hot. You wouldn't want to go in that water, period. I figured everyone would have figured that out. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Good catch. Yep. Yeah. That's Fahrenheit. Those were all in Fahrenheit as well, not just the 61. Um, so I just put this pattern. I would never fish that pattern on the right, but somebody tied one hell of a realistic looking caddis. Um, but uh, so the upper section, so a reminder, that's kind of above Fergus area. Um, that's a caddis factory. Like the close the tail water, you get close to tail water, caddis land. Um, yeah, not that there's not some other, you will see mayflies there for sure. Use your eyes, hit a bush, you know, stuff like that. But in my head, I'm going to keep it simple. It's caddis. It is the last to warm up, but uh, then the last to cool down, as I was saying before. It can get really busy. People are, there's great parking in tombs, there's great stretch of water. People love that stretch. I love that stretch. It just can be really busy. You're going to hear famous sections like the, you know, the power lines, the, uh, you know, the, we got tombstone, you've got, I don't know, what is snakeys and all these, uh, what is something called a hog's pen. I've got all these new names and uh, the cedars, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, you're going to, there's great water all the way through the upper section for sure the whole thing um so it's a great section it should be busy just know that it gets busy for sure and people tend to rush there a little too soon for me i, I kind of save it till the water temps dictate it um grab your favorite caddis patterns hint use a hair's ear or something i've tied here whatever you like uh rockworm caddis are all through there so a green caddis tan caddis for sure and case caddis for sure like, but uh, you know, hair's ear kind of does does most. 
I used to fish a lot of like specific rockworm caddis. They still work really, really well. Um, you can just use green like uh, like uh, floss or whatever you want, or um, that green micro tubing works really well. But I kind of just use hair's ear now, just a basic hair's ear throughout the thing and more worry more about presentation and uh, size. Um, when it does start to get warm though, and you're like, okay, it's getting a little warm, Bellward Conservation Area, I think it costs you eight bucks to get in there. There's a great set of riffles down underneath uh, the dam there and some nice water through there. It can be really good. That's some nice riffly bubbly water that uh, kind of give you some, some action when other uh, areas uh, are a little bit getting on the warm side. It's still, uh, it's a factory for dries because uh, caddis are everywhere through there. Just watch, you will get people fishing with bobbers with their kids and stuff because I mean, why wouldn't you? It's a uh, it's a section you can fish more than one fly uh, as well, if you were wondering, and you will, so you will run into the gear chuckers and stuff like that, but I still really like that section. Um, if dead, I would say if dead drifts don't work, fish active drives and nibs. So caddis move on the surface. If you're dead drifting a caddis all day and nothing's happening, especially with stockies, you want to just, just, you know, but any, any brown will come up. You know, try activating that fly. You know, downstream you can kind of wiggle the fly and skate it a little bit. You can strip a dry. You can strip nymphs. So I'll always start dead drift for sure, dead, dead, dead. But before I leave a section, before I take a fly off, try active fishing it. You know, lifting your fly up and down if you're fishing with a, a euro nymph. Um, you know, swinging your flies up. Maybe they're eating on the emerger. Move. Do something with those patterns versus just dead drifting them all the time. Again, dead drifts your base for sure, but then move from that, then change your fly. There's a great location for sculpins for sure and crayfish, remember your woolly bugger or uh, I tie a sculpin pattern, Chris tied it on the drift thing. It's way better than I can tie it. That sucker does really well uh, uh, there as well. Remember how sculpins move though. They go up and down and kind of dart into the rocks. So you want to kind of jig your sculpin patterns, strip them bouncing along the bottom. And hey, nice bonus pattern. That's how a crayfish moves. So you can take some really nice fish for sure. And don't be afraid to kind of slow play sculpin patterns through some deep pools, through some fat riffles, stuff like that. Um, another tip here. I see it a lot. Uh, I would do it in all section, but the, uh, this upper section has some real flat water as well. So you can get your riffles and your flats. And so keep an eye on those flats and tail outs for rises throughout the day. You will catch big fish sipping down on those tail outs. Those are a great place for big fish to, you will also get a sense of what's going on just because there weren't rises an hour ago. Keep an eye out all the time for rises throughout the day. So even if you're fishing in some fast water, just take a look, you'll see the foam kind of moving into a slower section. Keep an eye out for rises. Make sense? That is the upper. I'm gonna roll this awesome. thing. All right, the middle. So you've got caddis and mayflies and kind of the first hatch, the Jimi Hendrixons. So this is the, uh, this used to be a big deal. The old Hendrixons, they're not called the Jimi Hendrixons, but the Hendrixons. Um, so this is one of the first major mayfly hatches, I should say. Um, really good in the uh, conservation area. So uh, there's some great water for those, for some spinner falls can be, I put epic. So I guess I yeah, epic at times uh, for sure. Um, blondies kind of, and that's getting into the middle lower section. Uh, but the, that middle kind of area can be really good. And I found the park area actually. I mean, if you want to pay to go in, there's other areas to go. It's fantastic for Hendrickson's. They the fish can really key on them. And a great nymph is a pheasant tail, um, straight up, just your usual pheasant tail. Don't be afraid to swing it as well, because once they they will, you know, all of a sudden there's some bigger bugs in the water. They, they, the big fish will move into the riffles uh, for them. And uh, um, this is where I said, don't be afraid to mix it up. Uh, I, a thousand years ago when I was learning to fish, fish pheasant tails for hours in the same section. As soon as I start swinging it, I, I was catching fish like nonstop and some really nice ones. They just wouldn't eat it on the dead drift. They wanted it emerging. Um, so keep your dries and uh, nymphs simple. If you're going to fish a spinner, just tie it black or dark brown. Don't 
whatever size 14 will get you pick your favorite one it'll be much more can you drift it uh, uh you know in a way that uh, doesn't uh you know drag if you're fishing a spinner that's a dead drift for sure um but keep your flies simple and like i said remember your mayflies start to get lighter not yet but in this middle section you start to see your k hills and stuff like that those are lighter dry flies for sure and you'll you'll see them they're just like whitish flying around hit a bush or two you'll see them as well um when you get when you start to get those major hatches that's like your june time frame you know ish middle of june um if you get to the water in the morning keep in mind a lot of those hendrickson's uh they're hatching in the afternoon uh, according to the chart as well but again use logic you know it could be varying times throughout the day or the weather but the spinner falls happen in the evening those fish went to bed quote unquote eating a bunch of spinners um in the morning, you can use a spinner as a searching pattern. So they'll still come up for it. Again, you can target back eddies and stuff where spinners like to uh, congregate, get washed into, but uh, do not be afraid to tie in a spinner first thing in the morning and just go up the river kind of prospecting for fish. Um, crane flies, trichos, canis, they live there around here too. Um, trichos, there's about a million articles written on trichos, you know, and all the females and the males and the different colors and they're early morning. Um, you'll get a ton of rises to them. They're just small. Uh, I don't believe in they get that dialed in on to various stages, like it's a female versus a male, but you better have a pretty good drift <laughs> and you're, you're putting your dry in, in with a bunch of uh, naturals. So it, it can be a little bit trying at times, but it can be fun as well. And then I'll give up and strip a streamer through or something like that. But uh, you can definitely test your technical capabilities. For those who fish the grand, there's the legend of the crane fly pattern everybody's got a secret crane fly pattern. They'll never let it out, maybe in their will, probably not. They're gonna be buried with these crane fly patterns. Um, I do uh, lots of uh, kind of tying sessions around the Grand River and everybody's, what's, what's your crane fly pattern? I don't have one. <laughs> so um, what I use is a really, really small, uh, like a size 16, um, it's on a, um, a clean camera hook. It, kind of looks like an emerger and I just collar it with a little bit of CDC. So it's kind of got like these crumply legs. It works okay. Um, but if you look online, you'll see a whole bunch of crane fly patterns. Um, they truly, truly can get picky and, you know, want crane fly patterns sometimes, especially when there's, you see that sipping type of rise. So a caddis rise just for those who might be beginners. You know, you're going to see more of a splashy rise or it's a stocky, but if it's a caddis rise, it should be a little bit more of an aggressive rise uh, because cat caddis tend to fly away faster. Uh, Mayfly is more of your standard kind of beautiful rise. Um, spinners, they'll sip them. Crane flies, they sip them. Midges, they sip them. So if you look at a flat water, you see a real sipping. It's, it's probably a crane fly or I, in my mind, I go a midge, but you know, Keep an eye on crane flies, keep it in your back pocket. Don't get distracted or scared about them. Just know, okay, it's been a tough day. What were they eating? Maybe an ant, maybe a crane fly. The, Ian James and I for years got our asses handed to us because of crane flies and ants, but it uses one of those two. So if you can't catch a fish on a dry, remember those two. Uh, and then you get really bad tuber hatches in this section. So as it warms up, you'll find people on inner tubes start coming down. Once you see your first inner tube, it's time to find a new section because the tubers are a coming. So uh, keep an eye on that one. Uh, and then the lower. So uh, that's where Drake lives. I thought he lived in uh, you know a different part of Toronto, a bridal path, I thought. It's not true. He lives in the lower section. So those brown drakes, uh, you know, the hexes, uh, the kind of epic mayflies that people want to fish, they're in the lower section, in Verha, Wilson's Flats. Go down there. It's actually pretty good in the evening. It's not that, you know, the only thing you might run into is a werewolf or something like that, but you're not going to run into you're gonna trip on anything. Um, it's pretty uh, good waiting. If you are going to fish in the evening, though, Check out your surroundings before you go down there. Don't go down there in the evening for the first time. Just scope it out. See where you might have to wade. 
don't you don't you know they're the drakes like slower water um so do hexes they're kind of a burrowing mayfly by the way when they swim they kind of wiggle so strip back to stripping nymphs varying it up you don't have to remember you'll just kind of key into one of those um but you know you're bringing out your size eight drakes and uh again it's at night so people get hung up on color I don't know, it's probably a silhouette, which is black, whatever. Uh, but this is a really fun section for those who are a little more adventurous, but you can go down there for the evening and do nothing. I have lots of friends that camp for a week just to fish the drakes, but that Inverhaw section is excellent. Uh, midges are, are down in the lower section as well. They're very prevalent in this area. It's great water for swinging wets, see midges. So um, I like to check spider webs. Uh, there used to be, before they changed the bridge and put that nice bridge down by Wilson's Flats, there'd be a lot of little spider webs and stuff like that. Um, this section just, you go, oh, okay, there's a lot of black midges, a little black magic uh, wet fly, uh, little, uh, little classic wet flies work really, really well in this section. And this section, you get into some two fly water as well. You can sometimes swing too, uh, but a... Uh, single wet fly kind of classic uh, fishing uh, and dry flies can rule the day. This is great dry fly water for sure. It's pretty flat. Uh, you get a lot of fish rising. It's early season water in my opinion. Uh, and, and the other one I'll do here, especially downstream from Wilson's Flats kind of heading towards Montrose. You, if you want to cover water, put on some streamers and just go. Um, you might not catch a lot of fish, but there are some big browns that live in there for sure. Um, that's a mindset approach. Uh, so if you're looking for something to do and just say, I'm going to go, I call it unicorn hunting. That's a great place to do it. You probably won't run into as many people, but you will find a lot of canoeists and stuff like that. So it's just one to be wary of. There's a nice canoe launch there. You get a lot of people coming. So weekends can be a little, eh. when you get below Wilson's flat, they tend to launch at Wilson's flats and go down. I used to love fishing streamers down that section just be ready for canoe traffic um, at that time. Um, this is a great, I find it's a short season down here. So this is where I was taught how to fly fish. Uh, we spent a lot of time down in this section, but when I, you start catching chubs, stuff like that, um, take your thermometer out, it starts to get warm, it's time to move on. So there's almost like a cutoff point you'll start to find. Like I'll start going, okay, Wilson's Flats is out for now. Okay, now I'm up to a place called Blondies. I don't know what they call it anymore. Blondies is gone, but it, you know, it's up river from, from that. Uh, okay, that's getting too warm now. Okay, that's the cutoff point. I'm not going to fish there anymore. I, I kind of work my way up that way, weather dependent and stuff like that. Um, but that's an area, once it gets a little warm, outside of coming in the evenings for your drakes and stuff like that, I kind of stay away from it. Um, and it, I, I like days patterns down here a lot. Because uh, the water's slower, you don't tend to, to get as many sculpins. Not that a sculpin wouldn't work. And like I, I do like Thunder Creeks, but don't forget about the old school Gray Ghost. That is like the an OG streamer on the Grand, and it is still awesome to this day. And it's a super cool looking fly. So for if you're a real fly tire and want to feel kind of nostalgic, you can start throwing wets and Gray Ghosts down in this section and, and have a lot of fun. Cool. We had a couple of quick questions there. Oh yeah, hit me. Um, yeah. Andrew is asking if you find that the tubers spook fish. Yep, and me. <laughs> I had, yeah, uh, they do. They reset. Back to they reset pretty fast. They for, they certainly reset fast. But I find there's times where you're just like, oh come on, man. Um, so uh, you know, uh, you just it, it again a week. Like I, I just kind of go, okay, enough of that. Um, but yeah, they, they'll spook fish. They get used to it. They got to eat, they got to live. Uh, but they, it, I find it just can get annoying, uh, for myself. You get, okay, you wait for that. Okay. They're they've reset and another tube comes down. So it just can get really busy. That's when I tend to go to that upper section tombstone area or whatever, you want, like above upper all through up there. Um, that's where you don't get tubers. The stretch, and I, Andrew, and I, that you should be aware of for those tubers is right in the Alora Gorge conservation area. You don't yeah. really find them like other like canoeists and stuff is another story, but as far as tubers go, uh, they run a like tubing program down there. So it's like at a certain point, maybe a third of the way downstream the gorge down to the bottom of it. They get out. Yeah. So it's called the gorge area is probably a good clarification and the lower bridge and the, they'll go through there. Uh, and I didn't spend a lot. I should have put about a picture the gorge area is 
Oh, it's kind of this, I was gonna say gorgeous. Uh, it's ridiculous. I didn't mean to be say that, uh, but it actually is a really cool place to fish. Um, it's really unique, and you know, if you're looking to explore through the Grand, um, the the gorge area is really cool. Um, it's underrated so, among anglers, I would say. Yeah, people that don't. Yeah, and uh, so don't be if like, and I like the Grand is like. There's the hot spots everybody goes to. And then do some exploring. There's lots of easy access. And uh, and don't be afraid to fish the gorge area. Call Drift, call me, call any local fly shop. There's a bunch of access points. It's pretty well marked. And um, again, they stock 20,000 fish through the Grand. There's probably fish where you're going to go. Yeah. Um, I'll say um, it's probably less tubers early season when it's still cold. Like most of them are like pretty casual campers in the Allure Gorge who go and tube it. So if you're going in like May and the water's not super high and it's safe to wait up there, then, you know, early May at least. It actually goes with the season, to be honest. Like, so, um, like, you know, May, most people don't feel like tubing anyways. It's too cold. And so you got good water through there. Yeah, like you, when the tubing starts, you're kind of like, okay, it's summery. <laughs> you know, like I kind of go up river anyway, so. Well, the, but, uh, yeah. oh, sorry, finish your thought there. No, go ahead. I was just going to say one of my uh, more painful stories on the ground was fishing through the gorge one of my first times up there. And it was sort of like early summer and there were a lot of tubers. I finally managed to find a little bit of water, a little bit of quiet and ended up hooking a pretty solid fish. I was fighting it for a while and I just see them coming from upstream and the fish is sort of on the other side of the river. I'm here. I've got tubers like drifting under my line, eventually hitting me and like knocking me off balance, break off the fish. It's yeah. uh, it, it is annoying. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. It, it ends up being there's just some kid or something. And that, but so, yeah, it's just an awareness thing. So yeah. just, you know, and if again, just move, there's lots of space. Like the one yeah. thing there is, is a lot of space. Like I know people think the Grand gets busy. I think there's always space. And even if there's cars parked there, use your feet, walk a little bit. There's also space you can find. Agreed. And then uh, uh, Mar Marty was asking as well, if there's any evidence that as the lower river warms up that trout migrate up the river to more reasonable temps. It's a great question. Like, um, like, so logic would dictate like there, there's a cutoff point and they like, that's the classic way of doing it. There's a cutoff point. What I can figure out is there's gotta be some, something down there where the big fish stay. They may migrate. I don't know. Um, I'm not a biologist, but, um, there, um, I don't know if they're, they go into some, some, some really deep water. There's some springs or something like that. Cause some big fish, I think just kind of live around there for sure. But m most trout statistic like in if you in any river migrate up um cutoff points like pennsylvania they start having cutoff points where the you just stop catching fish i just know when there are when i start catching a bunch of chubs and i check the water temperature and it gets too warm there might be some fish there i certainly can't catch them or they're i don't know what they're doing so it's a great question um they I would say probably, but I don't know for sure. Kind of I was really where they could migrate too, because like if anyone hasn't fished the dam, there's a bunch or the river, there's a bunch of dams and falls and stuff like you know, natural cutoff points they couldn't possibly migrate up to. No, but they might migrate up just naturally to like it's warmer. I'm gonna go up river program, oh, yeah. you know, until you do a certain think, spot. I've heard it said that through um I totally believe it, that through like the gorge and places like that. You know, big limestone cutouts that there's you know spring water that's seeping in through that rock oh, for sure there is yeah 100 yeah uh, up through the gorge for sure i'm talking the lower but i think they migrate up where they can for sure yeah yeah uh, that's awesome. a great question but so not sure but i do uh, you know if i'm just saying from a um, fish catching perspective i'm sure some biologists would know but i would say i just start to go yeah it's warm it's not as good <laughs> and i'm not catching anything um Couple and then any other questions, Chris? Because this is kind of my wrap up. Nope, okay. we're good. So here's kind of my uh, final thoughts on that. Um, things I see a lot: don't go crashing into the river. Um, there are rivers you sometimes go running into them. The Grand, hey, get there, just chill out for a second. Like, um, take a moment, look around. As I said before, watch those flats. Keep your eyes open, especially like what are they conditioned to? Once you hit about mid-June and there's been hatches going on, 
they're conditioned to looking up. So they will um, rise for, you know, random uh, on the surface, doesn't have to be a full hatch with fish rising all over. Brown trout feed vertically, not horizontally like a rainbow. They'll come off the bottom. They like rising. So keep an eye out just to see what's going on. Uh, if nothing's rising, okay, you have two choices. I'm either going to fish nymphs or streamers. I guess two choices right there, maybe third choice, or I'm going to prospect with a dry fly. Um, so you can prospect with dry flies as well. Uh, just tend to make them either bigger or a spinner in the morning, as I said before. But if you're going to prospect with a dry fly, make it like a size 12 caddis or a bigger mayfly, if it's logical for, for that time of year. Um, make it worth their while to come up to it. Don't go fish in a size 22 as a prospecting. Fish a size 22 if there's eaten tw size 22s. Um, uh, so most big browns are close to wintering holes and they move into the riffles to hatch. So that tombstone example, that's a big wintering hole. They don't stay always in there, move up. They like tail outs. They move around. They, they, they really do roam a territory. And so this, I do know they move up like they did a study around uh, brown trouts moving around a river and there was one on the grand and it it was roaming around like they're like big bullies that go around they'll crash minnows so if there's not a brown big brown were right now it could be back again uh they do move around and they are not always where you think they are they are in skinny water and stuff like that sometimes as well uh, we're talking like the big ones um so big browns you know back to water temperature. If I get into a really stable water temperature with a like 55 degrees to 60, 61, I think a trout can be anywhere because the water, the, the oxygen content is good through all. They don't have to be in super fast water. They can be in slow water. They can be where anything they want. Once I start to get over 60, a little bit higher, well, they're going to need more oxygen. I'm going to start concentrating on the faster water on the riffles. Um, they'll, they'll only drop into that slack water if there's food coming off, like there's a hatch or something like that. And so some general rules with that water temperature are really cold, probably slower water. Um, they get into the, that, that prime temperature range. They can be anywhere. Gets a little on the warmer side. Stick to your fast water and your riffles. Um, if you do, if you're fishing big streamers and throwing zoo cougars and chickens and stuff like that, uh, and if you roll them and you will, um, and you'll go, holy crap, there's big, <laughs> which surprises people. Um, a lot of times territorial, um, you know, mark that spot, go back with a nymph or a dry or go, okay, big fish lives around here. Okay. I'm going to fish this a little different when I go back. Um, the other one would be, I didn't put it on here, but if the fishing just totally sucks, there's been a barometric change or you're like, man, I have tried everything. They said I've fishing my nymphs, my dries, I'm moving them. I'm not moving them. I'm changing like, what the hell? Nobody's catching a damn fish, man. There, I can't see any, it's not even ants. It's not even uh, crane flies. Like what the hell? Um, that's a time for a big streamer because it's a reaction bite. And so it can save the day for sure. That's when I tend to put them on is when I can't catch them doing anything else and then see if they'll just get territorial and smoke something or I'll roll a fish. Uh, contrary to what I just said, you'd be surprised how big a fish you'll catch on small flies on the grand. Little 18, little 20s, 22s. Um, so the grand is really fun to get technical. A lot of people I take out are also going to go, they go to famous, they're going to, you know, Henry's Fork and stuff like that. And I'm not here to say the grand is Henry's Fork, but it's a technical tailwater fishery that you can work on fishing small flies, small dries and catching big fish on them. And so, you know, there used to be trying to catch a 20 inch fish on a 20 inch dry used to be a cool thing we used to try to do, right? And can you, you know, can you get, how, how big of a fish can you catch on a small fly? And I mean, we've taken, I mean, Ian was crazy with small flies, crazier than I was. And he used to catch 25 plus inch fish on little 22s and stuff like that all the time. Nymphs, by the way, as well. Um, so don't be afraid of small fish. They'll, uh, sorry, big fish on small flies. Um, don't be afraid of dramatic, dramatic changes. This is another bad habit that came out of the grand for years. Oh, you've got the wrong shade of olive or your brown is the wrong brown or I, your isonychia doesn't have a white stripe down its back maybe i'm totally wrong about that <laughs> but uh if i if you've gone really small and you can't catch a fish on a dry okay i went 20 or 18 20 22 yeah i'm getting into canis territory oh maybe i'll put a 14 caddis on maybe a 12 you know maybe a size six stimulator 
you know, just don't be afraid of trying dramatic changes within reason. Um, but a dramatic change might be, I'm going to go from my real natural pattern to a really bright pattern just to see what's going to happen. Nope, that sucked too. But you tried it. When you, when you think like that and you're not afraid to make those changes, you'll be amazed at the positive things that can happen as well. Um, you can prospect for sure with a big caddis up to a size six stimulator I've used. Um, that's getting a little crazy, but size eight, size 10, if you want to go big fish hunting, big fish like big caddis, um, that can be a, it's not done that often. And you can, uh, especially when they're used to looking up again, that's a prospecting play. That's not your day to day, but it's one that I would just put in your back pocket. Um, as I said before, Browns love crayfish and sculpins underutilized on the ground. It used to be a hundred years ago, everybody swung a olive woolly bugger and killed it. Nobody does that anymore. Nymph, find your favorite crayf crayfish and sculpin. I, I like a fly that does both. Uh, I don't need to get, I don't get hung up on the two claws or whatever. Uh, but don't forget about crayfish and sculpins. Um, if you get to those sections where you're like, gee, the temp is right, fish could be anywhere, what do I do? Well, look for little depressions. Like there's a flat area with a little bit of a dark spot, could be a fish in there. Oh, there's a little, little riffle over there. Check it for a fish. Just think of depressions, velocity changes, currency. Doesn't have to be major when the temps are right. If it's 63 degrees, 64, go right to the riffles. But if you're fishing around 57 temp, you know, don't be afraid, even those flat sections to check those little depressions. They could have a fish anywhere through there, especially when you, you start seeing the bubble lines going through them. If in doubt, follow the bubbles. Uh, and then season wise, kind of to wrap it up, you should fish bottom up, then back to bottom, uh, back to the bottom and up again. So you think again, cold water at the top, early season, it's going to be warmer, lower, then it's going to kind of, warm all the way close as you're going to end fishing in the upper. And then you're going to want, it starts to get cold again in September. That water that's flowing downstream gets cold again in Inverhaw and you can kind of start working your way back up.